Hi, welcome to the New Wave Theory course introduction. Uh, this course is actually going to be for people who have at least a bachelor's degree in science or engineering. Uh, other people, you can, I'm trying to make it as, the concept as simple as possible and you'll probably get the gist, uh, but you may not understand the math, that's fine. Goal of this course to produce an improved model for electromagnetic wave propagation. In the next few slides, I'm going to show you the deficiencies in present electromagnetic theory, but first, let me tell you who I am. I'm Robert Stinti. I've got a master's degree in electrical and computer engineering. I specialize in electromagnetic fields and waves. Uh, I've studied waves my entire life. My day job is in radar and microwave holography. My after hours, I study the secrets of the universe for fun. Modern electromagnetic theory is based on Maxwell's four equations. We're going to show, I'm going to show you in a, in a few slides the deficiencies of these models. Let's take the, these are the divergent models, divergence models. We're going to hold those off. We're going to discuss those in a much later, I think it's video three or video four, I don't remember. So let's put those off to the side. Instead, we're going to discuss, focus on the two that actually go into Maxwell's plane wave model. And so let's discuss this one first, and then we'll discuss this one. The first one is basically Maxwell's versions of, version of Faraday's law. And I've seen a lot of people really mess this up thinking this is a totally reciprocal model. And it's not totally reciprocal. Uh, and you can visualize it this way, that if you have a changing magnetic field that creates an electric field, and then if electric field change, creates a magnetic field, then you have a runaway condition where this creates this, and then increasing this creates this, which creates more of this, which creates more of this. So this is not a completely reciprocal model. And based on the models it's derived from, we're going to use a symbol from software engineering, which says that this is the cause and this is the effect. This is the assignment operator from computer languages, which basically state the operation goes this way, meaning that a changing magnetic field creates an electric field. Okay, but now we have a problem here because there's another electromagnetic model called Kirchhoff's law. And Kirchhoff's law in point form is this. In integral form, it looks like this. So you cannot have, according to Kirchhoff's law, there is no such thing as a curl of an electric field. And so the curl of an electric field is zero. So if the curl of an electric field is zero, this is a contradiction. And what most professors say, oh, well, Kirchhoff's law is only valid for, uh, for time invariant or static conditions. I'm like, well, that's not really true. Because if you go to an electrical engineering course, they teach mesh analysis using Kirchhoff's law for AC circuit analysis. So if it's only for static conditions, it should not be valid for mesh circuit analysis, but it's perfectly valid. And the reason why is Kirchhoff's law is an instantaneous condition. Not a static condition, it's an instantaneous condition. This must be true at any instant in time. Okay, that's what Kirchhoff, so this cannot be true at any instance in time. You know, we, we see Faraday's law work, so why doesn't this work? And Faraday's law says that the Magnet, changing magnetic field in a loop of wire produces an EMF around the loop of the wire. Well, okay, but an EMF is not an electric field. Now let me show you. Let's assume that we have a changing magnetic field which creates a current in this loop of wire. And let's say that the current in the wire is one amp. At an instant in time, it's one amp. And the resistance of the wire is one ohm. Well, well that would mean then that there's one volt produced in the loop. But where do you measure the one volt? Do you put your, your multimeter here and here? Do you measure one volt here or do you measure here? Where, where do you measure the one volt? It's, we can get a one amp in a coil of wire. That's not hard. That we can know we can do. But does it actually produce an electric field? Okay, and if you can't put, figure out where to put the leads of your digital multimeter to measure that one volt, you can't because there's no electric field that is going to be produced as a result of the changing magnetic field. So there's no electric field produced. What you have instead is an EMF, which is an electron moving force. So what happens is that the changing magnetic field imparts kinetic energy to the charges and pushes them around in the circle. It's not an electric field, which is a potential energy field. Okay, so this, and because so, otherwise this is, would be what you would derive. If you said that a changing magnetic field creates a voltage, this is the way you would write the equation. Not like this. But this is what Maxwell did, and this is why we have this. Because this is this. But this is wrong, and therefore this is wrong. Okay, yes, there is energy added to the closed loop, but it's not an electric field. 
which means since this is the basis for light, that means there's no electric field in light propagation because there's no way you can induce an electric field. So the critical point is EMF is not really a field. It's actu an actual mechanical force applied to charges by a changing magnetic field. But if we, put a cut, if we cut this loop, we put a cut in it right there, and then we change the magnetic field, you're going to get one volt measured across that gap as that kinetic energy induced by the EMF is turned into potential energy as charges concentrate across the gap. And you're going to measure one volt across the gap. And it doesn't matter where you put the gap, you're going to measure one volt across the gap. So it's not an electric field. EMF is energy added to electrons that's kinetic in nature. And once that kinetic energy hits the charges, then the charges will move around the loop. And if there's a gap in the loop, then that kinetic energy is going to turn to potential energy that you can then measure with your voltmeter to find that you're going to get one volt across the gap. So let's talk about amperes and displacement current. Again, this is not a reciprocal equation. Okay? A current in a wire generates a magnetic field. The current is the cause. The magnetic field generated is the effect. But what Maxwell did, he added this extra term here called displacement current. But wait a minute, if you have a charge that's moving, this is a current density, the J. So what is the changing electric field around a moving charge? Well, that can be computed from the divergence model for Gauss's law. This is done in another video someplace else in depth, so I'm just going to run through it. If you go through this derivation, you find out that the, and this goes this way, the changing electric field about a current density at dd dt is equal to j. Therefore, you can replace dd dt with j and find that the magnetic field around a solid wire should be twice what we actually measure, which is over unity. Okay, so this this is not correct. And so the critical point we learn from here is that you cannot use a changing magnetic field to create an electric field without the presence of charge. It doesn't work. You need charge to have this change occur. And you cannot have a changing electric field and create a magnetic field. Okay, you need charge. Needs charge to occur. Okay, because a magnetic field stores kinetic energy and electric field stores potential energy. You cannot convert kinetic energy to potential energy without something. It's just like in a ballistic pendulum. At the bottom the pendulum has kinetic energy as it rises against gravity it to converts that kinetic energy to potential energy. It can't do that without the mass. And that's where the flaw in electromagnetic theory is. is this has been done and been abstracted so much it's been thought to be able to occur without charge, and that is completely wrong. So one thing we have to learn is that very few people actually know how to use Maxwell's equations properly. And I'm telling you right now that if you're getting reasonably good answers from Maxwell's equations, you probably applied them incorrectly. And I have lots of examples. For example, electromagnetic radiation. For Maxwell's equation, when you do the derivation of the plane wave equation, the electric and magnetic fields are in phase. In other words, this peak and this peak occur at the same point in time and space. But the actual model that engineers use is in quadrature. When the real part of the field goes to zero, the imaginary is max. When the imaginary part of the field goes to zero, the real part is maximum. And because these guys are in quadrature, if you take the power any time along uh, the timeline, the power is constant. Where here, the power is, is, is stored in the fields. And here, at this point, both are zero. So you get zero power. Here, you get maximum power. And so you get this pulsating wave as it propagates. So if photons actually make up light. In this case, the photons have constant energy as they propagate. In this one, the photons go from maximum energy to zero energy to maximum energy. To, so there, you have a condition where photons blink. And where does the energy go when the photon passes this point? And how does it magically come back? Does it go to unicorn? That is, Maxwell's plane wave equation violates conservation of energy. And why am I the only person in the world that's jumping up and down and saying this is ridiculous nonsense? This is not what we use. This is what we use to great effect every day. And this is Euler's equation. I know it's spelled Euler, but it's pronounced Euler. Uh, another example is partial inductance is a means to compute self-inductance of an inductor. It gets reasonably good results, but they had to violate the rules of vector magnetic potentials where the results of vector magnetic potentials have no meaning unless they're applied to closed loops. That's right in the book. You look in the electromagnetics book, 
and it will say very specifically that unless you're considering closed loops, vector magnetic potentials has no meaning by definition. But that doesn't stop these people. They apply it to open loops and do some weird stuff to make it all work, and they get reasonably good answers. So again, this is an application that gives good results in spite of the fact that it's in violation of classical theory. Oh, and they justify it by claiming some nonsense about loops closing from infinity. Yeah, okay. If you have to apply unicorn dust to your derivation, you should check and make sure that the models you're using are good. And I'm telling you right now, vector magnetic potentials is fraught with problems. And here's the one that blows my mind the most. Electromagnetic waves only propagate at the speed of the light. When the fundamental field models supposedly, uh, that comp supposedly comprise light propagate instantaneously. Now I'm going to explain all the flaws the rest of the flaws in electromagnetic theory as the video series progresses. Um, oh, and yeah, okay, there are correct applications. There are applications of Maxwell's equations that do give the right answers. Okay, but even a broken clock is right once a day. And then that brings us to basic theory, uh, of scientific theory, which I've encoded in what's called the rule of acquisitions. And the first rule of acquisition is that correct answers prove nothing. It doesn't matter how many good answers your model of theory gives. If it only has one wrong answer, the theory or model is wrong. Okay, like we could, you would say the sun god gives a good, you know, and, and that's another thing. A lot of models out there only tell you what's going to happen, not why it happens. That's a critical point here. Like the sun god model tells you the sun's going to rise in the east and settle in the west. It doesn't tell you why. Okay, this Euler's equation that we're going to cover later explains that a electromagnetic wave or a wave is sinusoidal in nature. It doesn't tell you why. It just mimics the observed behavior, but it doesn't explain anything. But unfortunately, because we're human, we think, well, if we can mimic the phenomenon, we must understand it. That's completely wrong. It's very easy to mimic stuff. You can mimic words that other people speak, but you may not have a clear understanding of what the words are. Okay, and what we learned growing up as a kid, we learned how to mimic. So what we're going to do, the objective of this course is we're going to rediscover wave theory for the purpose of developing a more comprehensive electromagnetic wave model and, consequently, more comprehensive electromagnetic field models. We're going to start from the very, very beginning using water waves as a starting point. So the course outline is going to take, like, I think, about three or four parts. Part one, we're going to start from the beginning as if we didn't know anything. And you can read the rest of this. I'm not going to read that for you. Part two, we're going to do Maxwell busters. Um, I'm probably not going to do this. We're going to bust Maxwell as we go, like we did in the opening slides. Um, it's not hard to bust Maxwell. You just have to sit there and cross your I's and dot your T's, or cross your T's and dot your I's, whatever. From everything we learned, we're going to develop a new wave model by taking all the observed behaviors of waves and induce a mechanism which could cause that to be true. Now, from the rules of acquisition 1 through 5, we learned one very important thing. The odds that we're actually going to develop the true model of light is not very likely. We should never assume that we're ever going to get the right model. The key is, is to develop a model that's useful, more useful than present theory. And that model will help us do more things than we could do before, expand our footprint, and allow us to find the next anomaly which we have to solve. That is part of Distinti's gateway feedback uh, theory or model of science, which will be a, a video that will be out in a couple weeks. And the last part, uh, ultimately we're going to develop models that mimic already observed behaviors. The holy grail would be if the new models predict phenomena that we were not already aware of, which could be verified by hopefully simple experiments. This is to, to be determined. And note for physicists, physicists should rejoice when their models are shown to be wrong. Like Niels Bohr said, how wonderful that we have, we have met with a paradox. Now we have some hope of making progress. We should not blindly defend what we think to be the truth. We should actually go out of our way to find where our models and theories are wrong, because that's where the gold is. That's where the paradoxes and anomalies occur that give us the ability and the clues to go forward with even better models. Okay, I know how this is going to begin. I don't know how it's going to end. We're on this journey together. But you can expect that as discoveries and observations are made in later videos, they will have the probability of making 
content or idea is in the early video is obsolete. Don't feel jerked around. That's just how science progresses if it's done properly. As we learn more, we're like, oh, gee, that contradicts what we know here, so we've got to come up with a better way to explain this it doesn't, so these things aren't in contradiction with each other. Again, reference to the Stinti Gateway Feedback Theory. Thank you. I hope you enjoy this course. Sorry it's been a long time. Um, if you find this helpful in any way, please donate. Um, I'd like to be able to do this full time instead of having to work a day job. Um, go to my website, distinti.com. There's a simple donate button there. My, my website is woefully out of date. Thank you very much.